the unbearable cost of wokeness is starting to brew itself in Europe. Energy prices, food prices are just skyrocketing out of control, and it seems like this is starting to final hit a climax. Yeah, Josh, um, from my perspective, Europe's been living in a fantasy land. One of my favorite authors, George Friedman, wrote a book about this, came out, I think, 2016, Flashpoints. Excellent read. Check it out if, you have, if you're inclined towards geopolitics. A lot of the stuff that's happening right now, Friedman called out back in the day. But a couple points from that that I think are very salient to right now is in the conclusion, he made the comment that nothing is more dangerous than not knowing the cost of something, except, of course, perhaps not wanting to know the cost of something. You see Peterson, Jordan Peterson echoed this, where he talks about people being willfully blind on certain select issues. And so to take this all from there, and again, relying very heavily on what Friedman has talked about before, in 91, 92, when you saw the Soviet Union collapse, history, in a sense, kind of stopped. And you could say that from the period of 91 to 92 to, let's say, 2008, when Lehman Brothers collapsed and you had, you know, the, basically the GFC 1.0, there was this period of peace and prosperity in Europe. And again, to quote Friedman here, the crux of the EU is this. The EU promises peace and prosperity. And so the question then becomes, well, if you take away the peace, pardon me, the question then becomes, if you take away the prosperity, must you also take away the peace? And if you look at the United States, there are two things I think you want to contrast this. In the United States, all that the Declaration and the um, Constitution promises is the pursuit of happiness. It doesn't necessarily guarantee or promise happiness, unlike the Europeans did in that case. And the second thing is that when America had our civil war, the question that we answered, and we paid for it with blood, so again, if you follow Friedman, this would be the second uh, um, institutional 80-year crisis, was that you were first an American, then a Texan, or a Californian, or a Floridian, or whatever they call someone from Massachusetts besides a flame so you were first that, then then you were a citizen of the state or whatever, right? And in the European Civil War, which Friedman argues was World War One and World War Two, you had all this blood that was shed, but at the end, there wasn't really anything that was bought from it because people still viewed themselves as a Frenchman, as a uh, you know, as a Briton or a British or as you know, Dutch or what Italian, etc. So you never really had this. And so what Europe sought to do after that fact is they tried to unify via technocracy what they couldn't necessarily do through blood, through you know, their own civil war where they threw their empire away, and through through and and, and through that. So when you had the Soviet Union fall, you had the reunification re of Germany. That put into tension some old issues in Europe, mainly what's the relationship between G Germany and France, what's the relationship between the Western European continent, which is where Germany and France sit on, and Russia, which has always been one of these you know, systemic problems that has always have to be managed. Case in point, see Ukraine for that. So anyways, what this all gets to is, is that from like the period of 91 to 92 to the period of 2008, the Europeans were able to remain at peace. And this arguably is a European achievement, according to Friedman. Now, it's a European achievement that was banked upon prosperity. And I will note from a personal standpoint that when things are prosperous, nobody asks why. There's a great song from Avit. Have you ever seen the musical where they talk about when the money keeps flowing and nobody keeps books or whatever, right? You can tell you've done well by the happy, grateful looks. And the point is, is that when times are good, the soul doesn't cry out for meaning. You know, you can just paper over it. And so you had all these countries that wanted to jump into the EU, mainly into the Eurozone, uh, because they thought that they would have access to, you know, the glittering towers of high finance, and they would become, you know, more civilized, more or more modernized and lived, you know, the Western European lifestyle. So the point was Europe, Western Europe got incredibly wealthy during this time. But the illusion, and this is, again, something Friedman points out, was that there's all these contradictions that were kind of being overridden by the prosperity. And again, you know, Friedman says this very well, where he says, okay, listen, the problem with Europe is this, like, consider the Germans or whatever, right? You know, the Germans are once again being forced front and center into a leadership role within Europe. But that's the last thing that the Germans want. The Germans psychologically are deeply terrified based upon their history of being in a leadership role. But yet again, here they are. And it just reverberates out from there. If you look at the EU and the contradiction of this point, you know, the EU seeks to, you know, how does Friedman say it? Um, they want to be one people, but they don't want to share each other's fate. You know, they they, they want to be secure, but they don't wish to defend themselves. Um, they, they want to speak their own languages and have their own cultures, but they don't necessarily think, you know, this will be a bar or an impediment to, you know, mutual, you know, or to, to uh, understanding everyone, et cetera, et cetera. It, or to boil it all down, I think, the the kill shot that Friedman says is at the end of the day they want to triumph but they don't want to risk and again this is back to you know the centralized crux of of of, of the Europe problem because you have people 
who, through fate and circumstance, after World War II, after the Cold Wars, and then after, you know, let's say the period, the very prosperous period of 91 to 2008 or whatever, right? There was a lot of money, a lot of the times that flowed into Europe, which allowed for, I think, a lot of decadence. And I don't mean, decadence can be like, you know, like fancy food and, you know, fine dining, et cetera. But I also mean like moral decadence or whatever, right? During this time frame, you saw the birth rate of Europeans plummet, essentially Europe. And not that America is doing much better right now, but the point is, is that the Europeans aren't replacing themselves. So woman needs to have what 2.12 2.13 kids on average to maintain stable population two kids because you need you need mom and or you need a husband and wife whatever right you know to um to create the baby and that 0.13 is to account for all the breakage and you know, all the kids that won't have kids or whatever so you know, 2.13 is just the historical number for the stuff but they're not replacing themselves and so what did europe do rather than actually demand that you know hey listen we need to curtail some of the individuality of this you know rampant pursuit for individualism you know you actually need to like you know make some sacrifices form families etc have kids yada 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 they just started importing a bunch of immigrants uh, into the society and again this is a real struggle with europe because if you look at like french or if you look at the french culture german culture whatever right it's not america like america has its faults but america can digest immigrants europe can't do that and so you're bringing in all these people to basically kind of like you know skew the books so that you fix the population problem but what you're really doing is you're creating a demographic bomb because the people that you're bringing in number one they're not assimilating to the culture because because the culture doesn't lend itself easy to assimilation. And the second thing, too, is that if you have deep-rooted philosophical differences of the immigrants you're bringing in, for example, if let's say a deeply held culture of Western Europe is that you have a separation of church and state, but you're bringing in a bunch of people who believe that, well, no, you actually want to have the marriage of church and state through Sharia law or whatever, right? The, these are inherently like antagonistic you know, um, um, ideologies. I'm not going to comment on which one I think is better or worse. I'm just simply saying that there's no way, or I do not see a clear way to square this circle. These two ideas are inherently antagonistic. And the more and more and more the European birth rate plummets and the more and more and more you see, you know, immigrants being brought in and that birth rate remains elevated. Europe is going to, and it, it's a slow moving bomb that's going through that. So anyways, this has been a long 10 minute rant for me to take us all the way back to Ukraine and to take us back to, you know, this horrible cost of the wokeness, because I think for the longest time, all that Europe really had to do, and I'll pick on the Germans for a second, is like, oh, we just need to do what makes us feel right, because we have the morality of a five-year-old, things that make us feel good are good, and things that make us feel bad are bad, or the entire morality of the boomer generation, but that's a different story. Anyways, so you, you have Europe that's, had, and the Germans, whatever, right? They took off, the, they, they, they shut down their nuclear reactor starting with Schroeder back in uh, what the late 90s, early 0s, whatever. That's when the plan was put into place or whatever, right? They refused to, or they, for reasons, you know, for, for green reasons, protecting the environment or whatever, right? They basically shut down their own ability to produce, you know, their own energy. Or they, they, they severely uh, hamstrung themselves to do that, which, believe it or not, you know, suddenly put them much more reliant upon Russian, or they, they put them much more reliant upon importing energy. And what's more, they're importing energy from a country that, number one, is you really can't trifle with or back up. It, it, it's strong enough to push back. I'll say it like that. And number two, you know, you've got this, you know, this, this value conflict. But again, Europe, you know, especially the Germans, you know, they were so keen to start this moral virtue signaling. They were so keen to say, like, look at how good we are. Are. Look at how great we are. If you're familiar with, you know, the Bible or anything like that, it's like the Pharisees of old, you know, people whose ego would masquerade as humility. Do you want to get a word in edgeways, Josh? Sorry. I would like to get away. <laughs> oh, sorry. Let me, yeah. let me just shut up for a second. This has been a good rant. Josh, Josh, your thoughts, your thoughts, your thoughts. Right now, Europe wants to eat its cake and have it too. Let's actually go to the internet. We're seeing that Europeans are starting to become unwilling to pay the price to defend democracy in Ukraine. As Justin was just saying, this wide, vast of uh, virtue signaling where people have these bumper sticker slogans that they just they throw the Ukraine sticker on their car. And now they're purely uh, virtuous and, and they believe that because that's the way that they feel, but they are not willing to risk anything. And now look at the, these surveys are starting to find that 58 to 59 percent of EU citizens are not ready to accept rising energy and food prices as a consequence of sanctions against Russia. So the the majority of, of uh, Europeans are no longer willing to sacrifice their cost of living to help Ukraine because they want to virtue signal against Russia. But oh, no, 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 no. It's not so much that. It's like, oh, wait a minute. I actually have to make a sacrifice to virtue signal. I just can't click a like button. You, you mean I have to give something up? Oh, no, 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 Josh. We can't take away the prosperity. No, yeah, so no, no, no. But what is actually happening in Europe? These draconian measures are getting even worse. Germany just came in the other day and said that they're not going to restart their nuclear power plants. Why? Nuclear is first off the cleanest form of energy at one of the lowest costs. It is one of the uh, best forms of energy that we could possibly have. So then what happened a few days after that? They said, you know what? We're not going to restart our, our nuclear power plants, but 
We're going to fire right back up the coal. We're going to start importing from Russia again. It is just absolutely utterless. And, and what is actually going to happen? Because they are not actually taking any actions to proactively stop any of this. They're not going to say, all right, let's produce more energy. They're just they're just saying, OK, I no longer want to virtue signal. But keep keep doing whatever you want. And these policies are continuing to get more and more draconian. They're going to get less energy. They aren't lifting any restrictions. And Russia is going to just give them a big F you. And these guys next winter, I, I couldn't even fathom what's going to be going on. I, I mean, people are going to be looking at Germans that have hot water in their house like they're uh, like the richest people on Earth. They will freeze to death, hungry and cold in the dark when they flick the light switch and the lights don't come on, to quote another person you and I both like to follow in that regard. But they're not doing anything about it. They're finally starting to say that they no longer want to take the cost. They no longer, they're, they're no longer gonna put the bumper sticker or they are fine saying, maybe I support Ukraine, but I don't want my cost of living to go up. I do not accept that risk, but it's too late. And, and they're not reversing any policies. They're not starting to say, all right, guys, Let's actually start getting gas from Russia. Let's let's open up our power plants again. They're just they're gonna have to take it up the ass. And I mean, it is going to be a massive log that they physically cannot take. Yeah. So the the two and I say this more so from like this is just kind of my own personal take on the situation where the, the, the come to Jesus moment that you know Europe's gonna have to face whatever. Right. Number one, U.S. is, is uh, not too far off either. I mean, we're better, but it's not. We are not a panacea. Yeah. So I mean, I'll, I'll, let me let me. Put a pin on the U.S. because I've got some thoughts there. But as far as Europe goes, this is the first thing I would say is that, number one, the first rule of dating and mating or relationships in general is that the person who holds power in a relationship is the person who holds the power to walk away. Russia can walk away from Western Europe, but Western Europe cannot walk away from Russia, or at least not for the next, the next three to five years without a massive amount of infrastructure being built up. That's the first thing. The second thing is I, I, I've got a friend over here. Um, lives up in Dallas, you know, good person, you know, very good salt of the earth person, you know, smart, but in, in, in a, um, in a very practical manner. And I, I make that he, he and his wife have never been to Europe and they, they keep talking about going to Paris, whatever. Right. So my first comment is, is, oh, well, if you want to visit an Islamic caliphate, you know, I would suggest going to Dubai or Oman, but <laughs> apparently nobody likes it when I say that. But the second thing I would say is the first thing you do when you get off a plane in Paris, you get off a plane in Amsterdam or whatever, right. You're going to think to yourself, oh my God, all these guys are fucking gay. And the answer is, well, they're not necessarily gay. They're just European and there, there, there's a weird difference between there and I used to say it as a joke but then I realized it was kind of a joke that wasn't a joke and Josh this is just pure speculation on my part it's not even a hypothesis but it's just something that I know if you go back to let's say 19 what 13 or when, when did World War One start I think it was 13 or 14 or whatever right so you basically decimate so here's what would happen right you know you, you you had the slaughter of males or whatever right and the people who were going off to fight were essentially and I'm gonna say alpha's not the right way to say it but the people who were going off to fight would have been let's say more would be more of the high T males back in the day these people all got butchered in World War One then you had World War Two which wasn't any kind or whatever right and so the only like males that survived were kind of the people that weren't necessarily fit enough to go to war and i wonder so you talk about weak men or whatever right and it's kind of like you know the opposite of what fear oh, let me change the words really carefully here you had a series of events that's that genetically selected for weaker males or you, that, that genetically selected for males who otherwise were not on the front line for a variety of reasons in World War One and World War Two, And likewise, the males that were on the front line had a much higher mortality rate than those that were not on the front line. And so I'm very curious to see, and this is the thing with demographics, that you have to like get really, really, I mean, like it happens in slow motion, so it's really hard for us to perceive. It's like, you know, watching like, you know, the, the plate tectonics or whatever, right? You know, yeah, they move, but if you're only moving like two inches a year or whatever, right, it, it's, it's, it's hard hard to it's hard for us to zoom in or to um, lock in on it anyways so i kind of wonder you know if europe was essentially having you know a crisis of masculinity that went through and then you have the vilification of masculinity and looking at you germans uh from um in the wake of uh, in the wake of world war ii right there and but in any think, you would think the germans would be first people to be repenting any of these policies with their grandparents being part of the biggest catastrophic uh event that most people consider in history and they are oh, the germans ruin europe every 80 years or so it's just their thing and they're, <laughs> Sorry, they're, asking for, they're quite literally asking yeah. for it again it, i'm just like this is much more a wake-up call like like what are you guys doing i mean there is a cost to your actions and it, it just looks like, like people are not ready 
Yeah, and I guess sorry. So the 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 title of this video and like the, the concept is like okay, this unbearable cost of the wokeness. And like, let me be really clear. Like, of course people want clean air. Of course people want clean water. Of course we want to help out other people. Like, I'm not saying that's bad or whatever, right? But just like they say on the fucking airplane, you know, you put on your own auction mask before you help others. Or said another way, how on earth can you help others if you first can't help yourself? So in other words, Europe, you know, and it goes back to the Bible. Like, you know, clean up your own house before you start lecturing and tut tutting the rest of the world because in your moral indulgences what's happened since then or whatever right so look at the ukraine thing europe if you're really about to pull back support why on earth did we have the war in the first place see here's the thing we could have gotten to the very end okay russia you want land or whatever right here you go or better yet like if you're not willing to support ukraine then there should have been clear and direct language coming out of nato and the other various bodies saying like ukraine you can never apply for membership like look we'll trade with you you know we we can do all this other stuff but like we have to have this buffer state you know to buffer and, and this isn't new news again think back to friedman and other people of friedman's caliber they called this back in the early part of 2000 or the 2000s josh and so it's one of those things we just look at the utter and collective stupidity of you know our leaders or if you say our leaders thank god i'm not european they're their leaders and you, you just kind of scratch your head and say okay well listen you know it's one thing if you just blow a bunch of money or whatever right because lord knows i'm guilty of that you know <laughs> vegas <clears throat> but the point is that um beyond that like th this is blood that's being spent now and like that that kind of goes beyond it and so like what's the point J just to coddle you europe just to make you feel better just to you know prop up you know your fragile sense of self-worth just to so that you can look at yourself in the mirror <laughs> as you or excuse me assuming you have any light heat and food to look at yourself in the mirror to begin with because that's kind of what you've done since then you know like i guess maybe this is my question for you for europe for western europe in general is has it been worth it has it been worth it knowing what you now know if you had to go back in time and assuming you had access to you know the finance ministers the foreign ministers etc like you 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 had access to the various levers of power or whatever right would you make the same decisions and if not how would you explain it to yourself in the past that wait a minute you know you're 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 really running on some wrong assumptions here sorry for the long video sorry for the rant but the true cost of wokeness is starting to awaken, and we have just touched the surface. Sorry, yeah. Europe, the bad times are over, but don't worry, because worse times are coming.